What is up, most distinguished viewers of this channel? So I got a fun video for us today. We are going to dive into what's known as spray arc welding and see the benefits and the drawbacks and talk everything about it to where you get an introductory to it and you understand a little bit more about what it does, why it exists, if you can even do it, etc. So with that said, let's get into it. I've done a lot of testing on this channel, and one thing I have not tackled, and I've had many, many people request it, is spray arc welding. And that's why I thought, well, I got time this weekend, why not sit down and do a lesson on this to where you're all up to speed and you understand what it is and what it isn't. Now, to understand what spray arc is, you have to understand how wire processes work. So let's go to a quick book learning session. I get asked a lot to talk about the different wire processes and the different modes of transfer. And I'm going to do a whole video on that so that you guys get up to speed in the future. But for right now, you need to understand a little bit about what's going on so you understand where spray fits in. Now, all wire processes, generally speaking, unless they're flux cord wire, fall under what they call GMAW, which stands for gas metal arc welding. Now, because I'm not an engineer, nor am I a college professor that has to use engineering terms, I do not refer to them by GMAW. I refer to them as short circuit, short arc, or MIG for the lower values. Globular is what stuck with me, and that's what I call it, and that's what the industry calls it for globular transfer. And then spray, which is technically more aligned with mag welding, metal active gas instead of MIG. Uh, spray welding is more or less very high values and wire feed and voltage. Okay, now back to short circuit. I get a lot of heat on this channel for calling MIG welding, MIG, or short circuit or short arc. The truth is I look at it like this. I'm not an engineer and I specify by street terms just because us at home, that's what we use. I don't feel that I need to call everything by their proper GMAW, etc. So you're going to universally hear me call short circuit wire welding is short circuit, short arc, or MIG, just flat out MIG. What this is done uh, is on lower amp machines, so your 200 amp and under machines, it's done with 100% CO2 shielding gas, or C25, which is 75% argon, 25% CO2. This process is the limit of what most home hobby wire welders is ca are capable of doing. When you go to globular spray, you can have issues achieving the values, the set points required for them on a home hobby machine. And I'll explain why in a second. Short circuit has a lot of, how do I say, limitations to how it works. Basically, the wire gets fed out of your contact tip. It stabs the molten puddle in a plate and then it shorts out, blows up because the current's so high the wire can't handle it, and then the wire then goes and gets pushed out again and does the same thing over and over many, many, many times per second, and that's what gives short circuit its crackle. At no point is that wire essentially liquid when it's moving from the contact tip to the molten pool. It's one solid wire, and it only blows apart. With globular transfer, which by the way, globular to my knowledge can only be achieved uh, with 100% CO2, you have an a instance of where the wire kind of comes off in big balls, globs per se, and then crosses a arc gap that exists between the wire and the molten pool. And essentially it creates deeper penetration but it makes a, a tremendous amount of spatter and requires a fair amount of power, plus it also requires 100% CO2, which you can use 100% CO2 with short circuit MIG, it's just a lot of people don't, okay? Because again, in theory, it can cause more spatter, while in globular, it definitely causes more spatter. Globular transfer is something that a 200 amp class machine might be able to achieve with like 030 or 035 wire, it's possible. But again, you need 100% CO2 and you'd be at the limit of what the machine would handle. But again, the end result of being more spatter may not be desirable. And that's where spray arc, which is what we're gonna talk about in this video primarily comes in. Now this is a poor drawing, but what spray arc is, is 
the wire is only a solid inside the contact tip and the liner as it gets fed there. And as soon as it leaves the contact tip, the voltage is so high that the wire essentially becomes liquid and it sprays through the arc that exists onto the molten plate. The benefit of spray arc is that you get really high metal deposition rates, aka big wells. You get huge penetration typically because of the amount of heat input. And it's a, basically huge benefits on thicker plate when you run spray. The downsides to it is you can't really weld thin plate. Like if you're trying to spray weld eighth inch material, good luck. You're going to probably burn holes and it's going to get far too hot. So spray is only generally done with quarter inch, three sixteenths and thicker steel. The other limitation with it is most machines cannot do spray. It's not just an amperage issue, it's a voltage issue. And to give you a perspective on it, spray R can be achieved with 035 wire at under 200 amps, but you need to be at 25 or 26 volts. Most home hobby machines are incapable of producing that kind of voltage at that kind of amperage output, which unfortunately will limit you to more or less the short circuit process and not spray simply because you cannot achieve voltage high enough to get to this. Now spray also requires special shielding gases. Universally, C25 will not work unless you put a tremendous amount of power and voltage behind it. So C10, which is 90% argon, 10% CO2 will work. And there's all sorts of other mixtures, including some with oxygen and hydrogen, all sorts of mixtures that will also help uh, a welder get into spray mode of transfer. And I'm going to show you through arc footage the exact difference, and this will all make 100% sense because you'll see it firsthand what's actually going on. Now, with all of that said, the last thing I'm going to say is, is that when you're welding in the short circuit mode and you attempt to weld very thick plate, you wind up with fusion issues because it doesn't carry enough heat with it. And no matter what you do, how much you crank up your welder, you're still going to have fusion issues, especially when you start talking half inch plate. When you switch to spray, even though you're using the same welder, the same wire, well, that's provided your welder's capable of it, but the same wire and just a change in shielding gas and much higher values, you can now safely get root fusion, get penetration, and weld thicker plate. And that's where the main benefit comes from with spray. So it's performance, it's deposition, and it's speed. And it's fairly affordable provided you have a welder that'll run it. So I think you understand this a little bit better. Let's go and talk a little bit more about the gun setup, the welder setup, and then do some test welds. So the welder that you use matters. And today I'm going to be using the Rebel 235 by ESOB. This is a intermittent use 250 amp output welder, and it's more than capable of fully spray welding with 035 wire, which is what we're using today. Now this has more than enough voltage potential to hit spray. And that's the big difference. This machine can actually hit 30 volts for a set point on output. Now for 035 wire and C10 gas, we're not gonna need anywhere near that voltage in order to get into spray. We're gonna be running 25, 26 volts. Now a conventional MIG weld would probably be somewhere around 20 and a half. We'll call 20 and a half, three to 350 inches a minute of wire speed for, I don't know, quarter inch plate, a little bit bigger, somewhere in that ballpark, right? With spray welding, we're gonna operate in the neighborhood of uh, 25 volts. We'll start 25 volts. And then for wire feed, we're gonna be up around 420. And the reason for such high wire speed is because you need, when you're running 25 volts, an arc will exist between the molten puddle and your metal and the contact tip. And you're liquefying the wire because it simply can't handle that much heat input. Well, if your wire feed is too low, what will end up happening is you're almost going to be TIG welding with your contact tip to the plate. You're going to have an arc that exists and it's going to start consuming your contact tip or fuse the wire to your contact tip in a burn back situation. And by cranking the wire feed up, 
that essentially keeps that from happening. It keeps the arc arcing off the wire for the instant that it does in order for it to not burn the contact tip up. You still need some pretty heavy duty contact tips and you generally will run a little bit longer of a stick out with spray to get a little bit longer longevity out of that contact tip over your short circuit MIG. So these are the values we're gonna start at for welding. Let's go back to the table, talk about the guns that you need and then do some welds. I have two wire welding guns. I have this Tweco 180, which this is typical of what you would find on a 200 amp class machine. It's not really designed for 200 amps of output, nor is a 200 amp class machine. It's intermittent use at 200, but this is more or less rated at 180 amps. This Spray Master, which imagine that, the <laughs> spray arc is in the name of it, is designed for 250 amps of continuous use, so much higher power handling. So not only is a power cable feeding this bigger, but the overall design is to basically to handle the high heat of spray arc. If you attempt to spray arc weld at 200 amps with this gun for a significant amount of time, aka more than maybe 10-15 seconds and multiple times in a minute, you're going to end up with component failures on this because it just can't handle the amperage nor can it handle the heat. And let me show you in the contact tip department the differences. As expected, the components are significantly different. Now the ESOB one here, the Tweco 180, uses contact tips that are held in by the nozzle. This Spray Master uses screw-in contact tips. I much prefer the screw-in type. You know it's tight because you don't want to have a loose connection in that, but this does work pretty good. The main difference here is a contact tip being so much longer puts all the heat far, far away from the gun itself, which is hugely important because when you're running 200, 250 amps at 26 plus volts, you're gonna run into a lot of heat and that heat has to go somewhere. And that's one of the reasons why this is stainless steel on the neck and this is like some form of rubber. If you were to put a rubber neck on this and try and run 230 amps and spray for a while, this will set on fire or start dripping. And that's why you don't typically see that kind of a neck on a spray gun and why everything kind of pushes the heat so far out. Even the nozzle, you can see contacts way back here, yet the heat is this far up. And that's to help dissipate that heat and not let the heat get to the components up here and cause failures. Likewise, when you look at the triggers, the trigger here can be activated at this point or up here. And the reason they did that is so you can take a really low grip on this gun to get your hand miles from that weld that you're putting down so you don't burn your knuckles and blister them versus this guy, the trigger's right here and the heat is right here. So you're talking maybe seven, seven and a half inches versus upwards of 10, 11 inches just so you can keep your fingers away from the heat. And that's something, if you plan on doing any kind of spray, you're gonna want a gun like this to keep your hand out of the heat or you're gonna get blisters, so. All right, well, let's do some actual welding now. So for this first clip, we're gonna look at the short circuit or short arc process. Pay attention to how small the white arc area is. It's gonna be very close to the plate and it's gonna sound just like bacon frying. That's what you wanna hear in the short circuit process. All of those BBs flying out of there, that's lost metal deposition. When we go to spray, you're not going to see that. All of the metal that would normally come flying out of the weld pool due to the way that it shorts out that wire and blows up the wire actually goes to weld metal. So now let's look at spray mode transfer. You're going to notice it's a lot quieter. You're not going to see buckshot BBs flying out of the puddle and the arc is going to appear to be much closer to the contact tip. Now this first video isn't the best, but watch it and then there's going to be another clip after that that shows it from a different angle.
So that arc footage hopefully help you make sense of what is actually going on with spray versus your standard short circuit, short arc MIG. I did a couple test welds and I cut them and etched them. And let's take a look at the actual weld penetration between short circuit as well as spray arc. So here's a test plate quarter inch thick. This was a pulled short arc short circuit MIG. The penetration is actually pretty decent on this flat plate, which it's realistically pretty easy to get decent penetration on a flat plate. The bead is a little bit crowned up because it was pulled. It'd be flatter if it was pushed. But this is pretty much the end of the road for the short arc process. It's not going to get much better than this. Let's look at another test. So both of these were done with a short circuit process. The one on the left was with 140, 50 amp MIG welder settings, so pretty poor penetration. The one on the right, same settings as a previous picture. Now, we have a lot better fusion with the higher settings as would be expected. Also, the plate was hot because I did the second pass right after the first. Now, a spray arc, essentially low end of spray is at the high end of the performance of what you would expect with short circuit MIG. So in the next picture, let's look at a spray arc weld. So the settings I ran this at were a little bit on the low side. I ran a couple and then actually did the video. So this is probably the worst performing spray weld you're going to see in this video. But you can see really huge penetration in the middle of it. Not the best on the sides, but that's typical of what spray looks like in the flat position. It mainly punches in in the middle. When you go and do fillet welds with it, you're going to see that it punches way in and deep. And it produces an overall flat weld versus more or less a convex weld that you're going to see with the short circuit process. Now let's look at some fillet welds. So this is the best that you're really going to get at about 200 amps with the short circuit process. It's really not going to get any better. There is some root fusion. There is a little bit of penetration here. This was done pulling because pulling increases penetration with the short circuit process. You can see the bead is not really roped up, but it's far from flat. This is overall an acceptable, decent short circuit weld, and this is what you should be striving for. Now let's look at a legit spray weld with proper settings. So huge penetration increase, which to be expected, and that has to do with the amount of heat input, as well as the high voltage and wire feed really crams the heat in to that root there and gets everything fused together. And this is why spray welding on thicker plates is so effective. Because the thicker you go with the short circuit process, you can get lack of fusion at that root. Well, spray, for the most part, doesn't care how thick the plate is. If you're running high enough settings, it will fuse it. Unfortunately, to get this level of performance, you can't get it with a 200 amp MIG welder. This was basically around 200, 210 amps, but at 26 volts, and I would say better than 75, 80, 90 percent of the machines out there in the 200 amp class aren't even capable of 25, 26 volts. So right away, that's a no-go. And you're going to melt down your components in the welder if you do any volume, even if it could do 25 volts. All right, let's move on. The cut and etch gave some pretty interesting results and one of the things you guys got to remember is that short arc MIG at its hottest and highest settings is essentially the penetration that you're going to find at the lowest settings with spray arc and different gas mixtures and what I have will also lead to different performance. So it's pretty apparent why spray arc is used, especially on thicker plates. It provides reliable deep penetration that you may or may not get with short arc and that is highly desirable because the last thing you want is some poor welds with absolutely no root fusion let alone penetration on something that actually needs it failure is the name of the game in that case but anyways i know you're probably saying well what are the other drawbacks of spray besides the fact you need special gas mixtures an expensive welder a ton of power for that welder etc well Probably the most serious one in, in my experience or my opinion is the lack of ability to run out of position. 
spray arc is to be run primarily in the flat position. If you try and do like a vertical up weld or you try and do overhead, guess what, pal? You're going to be wearing most of that molten pool because it's going to run like tap water right off the plate. Now, there are ways around that because obviously welding is like the <laughs> Pandora's box per se. There's always some way to figure out a, a way around a problem. Well, you can with pulse run out of position with spray. The downside to that is now you need an even more expensive wire welding machine like my ESOB 235 that we ran these on that does not do pulse. So now you're talking another thousand or fifteen hundred for a machine that does pulse. And then yes, you can do it out of position, which is awesome. And you can also do pulse MIG or short circuit as well. But you kind of need it with uh, with your spray arc. You can't do out of position welding with it. Short circuit MIG, you can. So that's a limitation. Uh, beyond that, it's I guess the travel speed it being so high and the heat level being so significant. For most of you at home, how much quarter inch plus plate are you gonna be welding where production value really matters? And how much are you welding that really needs uh, really good root fusion and the strongest welds possible? Well, for a lot of you, it probably isn't too applicable. And that's why you know your standard short circuit MIG welders are so popular because they're so versatile and easy to use and simple that they work for most jobs. But if you want to do some heavier steel quarter inch and up and a lot of it, the difference is night and day for production values and reliable root fusion when you go to spray. So with that said, let's go to conclusion. Well, what did we learn today, guys and girls? We learned that spray arc is an awesome process, right? <laughs> no, actually, it's awesome, but it has strengths and it has weaknesses, much like all of welding. And the primary weakness being the expense of the equipment. The equipment is extremely costly to get into spray. You need special gas mixtures. You need arguably a MIG gun that's going to survive. And then not only that, you need to be using it on material that's worthwhile. This is quarter inch. This is, you know, ideal for spray quarter inch and up. If you've got a bunch of eighth inch material to be running, uh, you don't want to be using spray. You'll burn right through. Not to mention, if you have out of position welding, you're probably not going to want to use spray unless your machine does pulse. And again, you're welding on thick material. So there's pluses and minuses to every welding process. If you happen to have a welder capable of spray, it's definitely something you should use if you're welding thicker material. The benefits of the guaranteed penetration are much, much better than the short circuit process where you can have a highly variable level of penetration even though welds can look good on the surface. And that's one of the things I didn't mention. When you're spraying and you hear that hiss and not much is going on, you know as long as your weld looks somewhat decent and consistent, you know that you punched in there. Short arc sounds the same no matter what unless you're running really bad settings so you can't tell just by the sound or what you're seeing to what extent your fusion is, especially if you push instead of pull with short arc where you lose fusion, that's gonna be somewhat of an issue on thicker plates. So it's just a reliable way to get fusion in the primarily flat position, if you can run it. And it sucks because wire welding in general has a bad reputation and I'm one of them that kind of gave it that or one of the people that gave it that reputation. And it's not that short circuit isn't good. It's just that when you start looking at dual shield and spray, they perform so much better, consistently better than short circuit that it gives short circuit a bad name. But truth be told, if you plan on doing stuff with liability and on thicker plate, you really should be looking at the spray transfer or dual shield or any number of other options for that rather than just sticking with the standard short circuit and praying you're okay. And this video hopefully knocked the dust off for you that haven't done spray in a long time or know very little. And then to you guys that are new, gave you a little bit better understanding of what's going on and what's trying to be achieved. 
In the next video, I will be doing actual fillet welds and lap welds and all sorts of stuff like that to where we can really iron out the differences between the processes. And I think in that, we're going to see a bigger difference between spray and short circuit. Okay. But with that said, thanks for sticking around for the video. If you got any comments or questions, you know where to leave them. Until next time.